Mr. Salas, as I said, is presently the Minister for Political and Congressional Affairs in the Mexican Embassy in Washington. He has previously served as political officer at the United Nations, and he has also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, International Organization Affairs in Mexico City. He was, uh, he's a graduate of Harvard University. He's done graduate work at the College of Mexico and at the University of California at San Diego. He's also taught at several institutions, including the College of Mexico and the School of Foreign Service in Mexico City. He's a career foreign service officer with a wonderful background, and uh, we're delighted that he's with us this evening. Minister Salas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for the, uh, for the invitation that you have extended to the Mexican Embassy to be present here today. As uh, you have been told, the ambassador, unfortunately, and due to unforeseen circumstances at the last minute, is unable to be here with you today. So I hope that I can uh, do a good job in conveying some of the uh, points of view that I think are important regarding the future of U.S.-Mexican uh, relations. Uh, it is certainly a privilege to participate in this gathering of the Baltimore Council on Foreign uh, Relations and have the possibility of addressing this very distinguished forum. <clears throat> Since the beginning, the beginning of this year, uh, the news about Mexico have dominated the front pages of the major American newspapers. Uh, I think you will need probably more than three meetings on Mexico to actually get the full view of what's been going on. We conducted a study at the embassy uh, just a few weeks ago uh, of the number of articles that were related to Mexico appearing on the, during the first months of this year in 40 newspapers nationwide in the U.S. It turns out that we ranked second the number of articles on Mexico ranked second only to those articles that refer to the President of the United States. I think that this gives you an idea of the kind of uh, situation that uh, we have been exposed to. And I think probably the good news here is that we got more exposure than O.J. Simpson. <laughs> At the same time that this has been going on, the United States government, both the administration and the Congress, have also spent a considerable time dealing with Mexico. Uh, thus, I think that it is safe to conclude that much has happened in the past few months to define the future of the relationship between Mexico and the US. Uh, the events of the recent past, to which I will refer to in more detail in a few minutes, have underlined something that we have known for a long time, but I think that it is very evident now, and that is the high degree of intensity that characterizes the interaction between Mexico and the United States today. Moreover, they have highlighted the fact that our two countries are acutely sensitive to developments on the other side of the border. It is no longer a question of size and might that defines our relationship, we depend on each other for a mutual well-being. Whether we like it or not, today we share more than just a border. We have a common destiny. Now, this is more than just a rhetorical statement. Most of the issues that affect our bilateral relationship have direct impact upon the lives of millions on both sides of the border. Thus, our problems, as well as our opportunities, cannot be tackled unilaterally. They require cooperation, coordination, and probably, and most importantly, a common political will to approach them. The proper administration of our agenda is of crucial importance to the people of both countries. Events in one, whether positive or negative, affect developments on the other. This is why the crucial issues of both our political, social, and economic structures need to be sensitive to their significance beyond our respective countries. In the past few years, 
our bilateral relations experience a very dramatic turn of events of a positive nature. The challenge that we have, that we face towards the future is to build upon what we have already, what, upon what already has been advanced in spite of setbacks or even of the attempts of some who wish to turn the clock back to an era where confrontations and suspicions were the norm in our relationship. When we review the wide number of issues that have a direct relevance upon the lives of both our peoples, be it in the over 700,000 jobs, American jobs, which are supported by exports to Mexico, or the flow of Mexican migrants to seek a better opportunity in the United States, one is compelled to promote a relationship where cooperation and understanding are its central premises. Along our border, several million people live that live on both sides depend on the coordination of both governments in order to address such vital issues as the protection of the shared environment and the allocation of some of the common resources. Most of the cities along the dividing line are united in terms of economic interaction in the regular crossings of millions of people in both directions. As a matter of fact, the U.S.-Mexican border is the most crossover border in the world with over three mil 300 million legal crossings a year um, and in cultural influence. One can safely say that the border is no longer a geographical separation, but rather a bridge that brings us together, brings our two societies closer and more involved with each other. In a larger scale, <clears throat> the multiple links that bring, us, that bring us together extend well beyond the border and reach deep within our nations. And this is why it is of vital importance that we move beyond prejudice and distorted images of each other and aim at a better understanding of our reality. And particularly, it is imperative that we strive to maintain the constructive course in addressing the many, the many issues that concern us. In the recent past, Mexico achieved profound uh, transformations that changed the nature of our economic, political, and social life. Particularly in the economic sphere, these changes reached all sectors of society and gave Mexico a different standing in the world economy. Our fiscal accounts, for example, experienced a significant improvement, and of special importance was the control of the inflationary spiral that had reached level of over, levels of over 100% and were brought down to single digits last year. The role of the state and its relationship with society also changed significantly with the process of privatization. 10 years ago, the Mexican government owned over 1,000 companies. Today, it holds less than 200 and is in the process of privatizing the, one, the ones that remain, with the exception of the oil company. Mexico's economy has also been mostly deregulated and is now largely open as we move towards a more competitive position in the world by expanding our trade links with our North American neighbors, but also with other regions of the globe, such as the Pacific Basin. Our relationship with the United States is presently experiencing a very trying moment. The financial crisis that erupted in Mexico since late December of last year has proven to be a defining moment in history, both for Mexico and for the, for the interaction with our northern neighbor. Much has been said and much has been speculated as to the origins of the crisis and its management. Unfortunately, many have tried to portray a distorted picture of reality and thus have clouded the many complex issues that have been involved. Particularly, I think it is important to counter those arguments that aim at explaining the current economic problems of Mexico as a consequence of voluntary schemes and cover-ups on both side, sides of the border. The origins of the crisis are actually far more complex as they involve both internal and external factors. Amongst the first, one can point to the unfortunate political events that dominated Mexico during 1994, such as the rebellion in the southern state of Chiapas, the assassination of prominent political figures, and even the uncertainty leading up to what turned out to be Mexico's fairest and most transparent electoral process last August. On the economic front, 
a series of factors contributed to the crisis. Mexico incurred a very high current account deficit, reaching 28 billion in 1994. At the same time, it was clear that the peso was overvalued and that some adjustment in the exchange rate had to take place sooner or later. External factors also played a role in sparking the economic crisis in Mexico. Amongst these, one can mention the continued rise in interest rates in the United States and also the nature of portfolio management by foreign investors. Together with the internal factors mentioned earlier, this led to an erosion of confidence in the Mexican economy, thus contributing, contributing to its downhill turn after the devaluation on December 20th. The government of Mexico has recognized that the crisis stems both from errors in the instrumentation of the economic model and a surprising reaction by the markets that compounded upon them. For example, on the day of the devaluation, that is on December 20th, nearly $6 billion left the country. Because of this type of reactions, the devaluation in December turned dramatic as it developed into a deep economic crisis with far-reaching consequences. At the core of this crisis was, and is, a problem of confidence that has proved to be the main stumbling block in controlling the economy. Thus, the, the, the strategy that has been followed has had two key elements. On the one hand, in order to restore international confidence and alleviate the pressure to meet external commitments, Mexico negotiated with the United States a framework agreement whereby the United States will make available up to 20 billion from the US Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. As you are aware, these funds are part of a broader package that reaches just over 50 billion, and that involve international financial institutions, such as the IMF, in what, in, in what is its largest operation in history, as well as private banking institutions. Through the availability of these resources, Mexico aims at addressing its key financial problems, such as meeting its Teso Bono obligations and successfully re refinance and restructure its short-term debt. The funding will support efforts to strengthen the banking system and contribute to stabilize the internal efforts conducted by the Mexican government to stabilize exchange rates and gain new access to private capital. The second element of this strategy has been the development of an internal economic plan that also aims at stabilizing the markets, restore investor confidence, and reinforce the foundations for long-term sustainable growth. The plan includes elements of fiscal reform, contemplating revenue increases via price and tax adjustments. Services, such as gas and electricity, will increase 35%. Gasoline will rise 48% during the year. And the value-added tax has increased by 50%. Additionally, public sector expenditures will be cut 10% in real terms, contributing to a fiscal surplus of 0.5 of GDP. We will also adopt a restrictive monetary policy and will limit credit expansion. The plan also calls for foreign exchange policy, actions to support the banking sector, and the maintenance and enhancement of social programs. The plan demands very severe sacrifices from the Mexican people and is bound to have a social and political impact. Yet one is hard pressed to think of alternatives that would have demanded less sacrifice without forfeiting the possibility of recovery in the near future. Particularly, it has been a very delicate balancing act for the Mexican government to take the necessary steps to achieve the seemingly contradictory goals of restoring, at the same time, the confidence of the international financial community and the confidence of the Mexican people. It will be some time before the stated goals of the economic recovery plan are fully achieved. Yet, in the recent past, there have been signs that lead us to believe that we are on the right track and that we have been able to reduce some of the volatility of the financial markets. The Mexican stock has changed in the past few days, has been gaining ground, and the peso has appreciated to levels that, uh, that are quite comfortable. We cannot, however, adopt a com complacent attitude, nor can we declare that the program is a success. Yet, by the same token, we cannot be concluded that the plan is not working. It needs to be given further breathing space 
And it is our responsibility, our mutual responsibility, both Mexico and the U.S., to give it a chance to advance further. Some other positive signs in this regard include the reduction of the monetary base by 22% since December 20th, and the fact that our trade balance has decreased from a nearly $3 billion deficit in 1994 to only $78 million in the first months of 1995. For all these reasons, it's why we are disturbed by the attempts that have been made to restrict the disbursement of the resources that were negotiated with the United States by declaring that the plan is a failure. It is the unfortunate nature of the markets that these types of statements or actions coming from prominent figures of the American political life can easily become disturbing, self-fulfilling prophecies. When so much is at stake for both our countries, one will hope that these issues should be handled in a responsible and statesmanlike manner. Let me emphasize the obvious. No one is happy with the situation that we're going through. The crisis has shaken the confidence that Mexico had gained abroad, and it has shed a negative light on the perception and reality of my country. Within Mexico, the economic problems have been compounded by political difficulties, and confidence has also suffered. Yet, I believe it is very important to highlight that despite the, the, these difficulties and the impact that the crisis has had on the well-being of all Mexicans, the strength of Mexico's institutions remain in place, and our society has been acting with a high sense of responsibility. I shall mention here that while the attention has been focused on the economic difficulties in Mexico, little has been said about some very significant political initiatives that are bound to have a long-term impact in Mexico and in our relations with the United States. Maybe the most important and far-reaching is the process of legal reform that was initiated by President Ernesto Cedillo in fulfillment of a campaign promise. The aim is to guarantee the rule of law at all levels of Mexican society and to address the many demands for a more transparent, independent, and accessible legal system. The government has already taken important and bold steps in this direction, the most notable being the investigations into the assassinations that disrupted Mexican political life in the recent past. <clears throat> Another development that is affecting political developments in Mexico has to do with the more active and participatory role that Congress is playing. The present legislature in Mexico is the result of what are widely held to be Mexico's cleanest elections, and its plurality is readily evident. The four parties that are represented in our Congress have been playing a significant role in issues as diverse as enhancing electoral credibility, negotiating a peaceful and constructive resolution to the conflict in Chiapas, and in debating and endorsing both the international economic assistance as well as the Mexican government's economic plan to which I referred earlier. It should not be underestimated that these two developments, legal reform and a more active Congress, will have a long-lasting positive effect in Mexico. Their significance lies in the reaffirmation of the independence of these branches of government and thus a more effective system of checks and balances. The consolidation of these changes will be, without any doubt, one of the most important legacies of the present Mexican administration. Both the economic and political transformations that are taking place in Mexico will have a direct impact in our bilateral relationship. A stronger Mexico will be in a better position to contribute to the bilateral efforts such as those at curbing uh, drug traffic or addressing transnational uh, environmental problems. A prosperous Mexico is key to the fulfillment of the many wide-ranging opportunities that the free trade agreement will bring to North America in the future. A growing economy in Mexico will enable us to address the problem of unemployment and better and well-paid jobs thus reducing the pressure to migrate. The single most important factor that will influence the direction of our relationship, 
that our relationship takes is the willingness of both countries to address our problems and face our challenges in an environment free of suspicion and recrimination, with a fuller knowledge of that which is distinctive in our societies, but also of what brings us together as two nations. At this point, <clears throat> I think it is important to mention something regarding the role of NAFTA in our political relationship. However important NAFTA is, and will continue to be for our two countries, its relevance has to be placed within the proper context and perspective in order to avoid two extreme pitfalls. On the one hand, believing that nothing existed before NAFTA and that the accord itself has been the turning point in the relationship, thus crediting NAFTA with the overall climate of open and candid dialogue that exists today. On the other hand, the different perspective is that of using the problems that frequently and inevitably strain our relationship, a relationship which is as complex as ours, into a litmus text, test, text of what NAFTA has not accomplished, or even worse, of why it should not have been negotiated in the first place. A final issue that I would like to address is the one regarding immigration. There are no easy and short-term solutions to this problem. Mexico fully understands that such a high percentage of uh, lost workforce drains it of some of its most enterprising and promising young men and women. A long-term solution demands patience from both sides, but above all, it demands tolerance and restraint. The United States-Mexico border, as a self-contained region where many of the opportunities of our relations arise, is also a place where numerous challenges may become critical problems. Building new walls or implementing border blockades creates tensions that exacerbate the immigration problem. Unilateral measures and policies tend to disrupt economic and social bonds between border communities and do not advance the short or long-term interests of either country. Our challenge as policymakers is that we must strive to clear paths of negotiation and dialogue in every single issue that affects our bilateral relationship. This convic conviction is, in and of itself, one of our most important assets, and it represents a pattern that must be upheld in the coming years. Decision and policymakers on both sides of the border must face up to this challenge of building a stronger, stable, sensitive, and respectful relationship. While being neighbors is inevitable, we have to work on good neighborliness. To do this, it is important that we avoid turning each other into a scapegoat of our respective problems and that we move beyond stereotypes that damage the image of our respective peoples. At the same time, we must not forget the fact that unilater unilateral approaches to the issues that concern us are usually short-sighted, frequently biased, and rarely permanent. As is the case in all times of crisis, this one is a defining moment for our two countries. I think it is important that we seize the opportunity to build a stronger relationship upon solid grounds. As we look towards the future, we shall not forget the extent to which our two societies have become intertwined. It is with this idea in mind that we can and will overcome our problems and defy the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you. The uh, question is, will you uh, inform us about Chiapas? Well, there are positive developments going on in Chiapas right now. The, um, the conflict, as you know, has really ceased to exist in, ex in its armed stage since January of last year. Um, it erupted in January 1st of 1994, and on January 12th, the Mexican government declared a, un a unilateral ceasefire. Since then, there have been no hostilities in Chiapas. Uh, there has been two stages of a process of negotiation. One that took place last year was a painstaking process of negotiation that came up with a proposal that the Mexican government presented to the rebellious forces. I think there were 34 points addressing uh, their um, specific concerns, most of which had to do with uh, 
addressing some of the social and economic situation of, of uh, the life of the people in, the, in, in Chiapas. Uh, that proposal that the government made at the time was rejected by the Zapatistas. Uh, since then, there was a standstill. The Zapatistas maintained control of some areas around where the conflict had taken place, and uh, there was a standstill uh, for a while, in that further efforts were made to reinitiate the dialogue, but they were not successful. Then again, in uh, February of this year, the government launched an incursion into the area to recover the territories that, were, that had been seized and were in the hands of the Zapatistas. Uh, this operation lasted just a few days. And the purpose of it was basically, as I said, to recover those territories under government control and so as to be able to renew the provision of basic and essential services such as water, electricity, and certainly education and health services. That was achieved. At the same time that that was achieved, the government once again proposed that a negotiation should uh, take place. Uh, there was a, originally an arrest warrant issued against the leadership of the Zapatistas. They were identified as to whom they were, because as you know, they're always wearing masks. And uh, there was uh, a further proposal later on of an amnesty law, which turned into a broader kind of proposal for a dialogue and negotiation and which had several conditions. For example, the Mexican government agreed to suspend the arrest warrants against the leadership of the Zapatistas and to reinitiate negotiations. Uh, this past uh, weekend, those negotiations started once again and um, there were proposals that were presented back and forth at the table. The Zapatista leadership that is heading the negotiation this time then asked after just one day to, uh, to have a suspension of the talks until, until May 12 because they wanted to consult uh, with their, um, I, I don't know if I should call it constituency, I mean their, their, their group, and, uh, and thus that's where things stand right now. In other words, we are in the process of negotiation uh, there is a pause at the present time. They will renew on uh, May 12. We are very optimistic that, um, that we are heading in the right direction. It is obviously a question of finding that common ground, which is important, um, of both for the, for the government and for the, uh, the forces that, uh, that rebelled against, against the government. I think that one issue that, that is important uh, to keep in mind is that since the conflict erupted last year and throughout all this time, there has been a uh, great amount of resources that, were, that are being funneled into the area of conflict and the Chiapas region in general to address precisely the kind of, of, of difficulties that, uh, that the rebels were claiming were the cause for their, for their uprising. So, uh, you know, not all of their claims or their original claims are valid anymore. Some of them have been addressed or are in the process of being addressed. Of course, some of them require long-term investments in terms of infrastructure, building roads, schools, hospitals, this kind of things. But, uh, but every effort is being made in that direction. And as I said, I think that, you know, we are making progress uh, in, the, in that sense. The question is, uh, what is the influence of drug merchants on the political process in Mexico? There has been a lot of speculation as to um, this influence. I think that one thing that we do know is that uh, these, the drug trafficking circuits have uh, gotten involved at high levels of government. There has, uh, they have been able to, uh, to uh, corrupt some uh, elements of our, of our society, creating enormous difficulties. Um, as to what, you know, wh whether this is um, a defining influence, I would say no. I think it is a problem. It is a problem that we are aware of. It is a problem that we are trying to deal with. Uh, Drug traffickers, however, are a formidable force. 
I mean, the, you know, the amount of resources that are uh, that are being handled by by these people is just enormous. And um, and this is one of the issues, for example, where I think the uh, there are there is a, a very ample ground for cooperation between Mexico and the United States. For example, one of the one of the issues that we need to tackle is uh, when it comes to drug trafficking is the question of money laundering. Uh, this is something that we cannot just do on the Mexican side. We need all the cooperation of the Americans uh, because a lot of the money is either being laundered here or ends up here somehow. Uh, so something has to be done in that regard. Secondly, uh, we are also working, trying to work even ever closer with the United States in terms of curbing the demand. Uh, the uh, drug uh, market is, is such that it, that it can shift very easily. Uh, for example, when we were able to crack down considerably on marijuana production in Mexico, then a lot of the production itself moved to the United States. The state of California, for example, right now produces more marijuana than all of Mexico. Maybe ours is of better quality, but uh, the fact of the matter is that the largest production is on this side. Uh, on other aspects of drugs, Mexico is just a traffic uh, um, for us, really where the route where it comes from other, other places in the hemisphere or elsewhere. So all of these things really require multilateral approaches. There is very little that, that the Mexican government itself or by itself can do without this broader cooperation. And I think that that is what we're trying to highlight because uh, I think that more than pointing out that this is a problem, it is a very serious concern that we have that we're trying to, uh, to, to avoid and that we're trying to do something about. The, uh, the observation is made that the devalu devaluation of the peso uh, under, first of all, surprised American investors and secondly, undermined their confidence in, uh, in investing in Mexico. And uh, how are you uh, dealing with this? Well, I mentioned some of the approaches that we are taking in, uh, in my presentation. Um, you're right in, in the sense that I don't think it was so much that either American investors or Mexican investors or just people at large in both countries were surprised so much by the devaluation as to the effects that it had. The, we knew, and the United States uh, knew for a long time, that the peso was uh, overvalued. This, this is a phenomenon that had been, that was present in Mexico since 1994, early 1994. Uh, the question here is, 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 is not whether if your currency is undervalued, should you devalue immediately. We had the conditions at the time, and I'm talking about 1994, that led us to believe that we could control this, uh, the, the, the level of, of, of that, the, that the peso was overvalued, and that in any event, at a later stage in time, we could start a slow process of gradual devaluation, but not a one-time drop in the value of the peso. Now, why do I say this? Well, first of all, we had international reserves in Mexico that were over 28 billion worth. Uh, there was really, you know, an improbable situation that one could have thought of at the time that a run on the peso could have exhausted those reserves. This is uh, something that neither anybody in the United States nor in Mexico thought uh, was possible. Now, as I mentioned, there were several events that started causing some concern. At the time of the, re the, the initial rebellion in Chiapas, this, of course, led many foreign investors to be very concerned. Well, you know, is Mexico still a stable country? Should I invest my money there? This was also a concern that many Mexicans had, and therefore some money flew out of the country. Probably there was a, you know, uh, some people were concerned about putting their investments in Mexico. However, when you think about it, the uh, uh, 1994, which was also the, the initial year of the North American Free Trade Agreement, money was flowing into the country. So there was 
sort of a mixed feeling as to whether, well, there might be a concern here, but nevertheless, it's still a good market. Secondly, the two political assassinations of the pre-candidate in March of last year and the second ranking member of the pre-party in September of last year. On both of those occasions, several billion dollars flew out of the country. Uh, some of it came back. Some of it we were able to counterbalance by the fact that the Treasury uh, issued a, um, a uh, uh, it was sort of a, a security uh, commitment to, uh, to, to bolster the peso, and therefore that prevented uh, any major problems at the time. The electoral process in Mexico. It, this is the first time in our history, in our recent history, that really uh, everybody was very, uh, was in the dark as to what the outcome of the election was going to be. There was no guarantee that, uh, that, that the ruling party in Mexico, the PRI, was going to win again the elections. Well, it happened that it did in what have been very transparent elections with international observers for the first time in Mexican history. Uh, but nevertheless, before the electoral process itself on August 21st, there was some concern. And again, there, was, uh, there were uh, economic problems that were being manifested. All in all, what this led to is that there was a reduction in the foreign reserves of, of Mexico uh, by over 10 billion by the end of the Salinas administration. We were, uh, when, when he left office, it was something around 17, 18 billion. Now, what happens when the new administration comes in? When the, uh, the day before the peso was, uh, the decision to devalue happened, there was a new incursion by the Zapatistas um, in the territory that they had control of, but also outside some of it. So there was some widespread fears that maybe the conflict was going to spread again. Uh, this led to a climate of uncertainty. There was pressure on the peso. The government decided its first decision was not to devalue the peso, but to extend the band under which it had been fluctuating for the past, uh, for the past years. Uh, it was unable to hold that because, as I said, six billion pesos left Mexico within hours on December 20th. Obviously, this led to, for the peso to plummet. And, uh, and as I was saying, the most important thing here was not so much the devaluation as such, but the fact that the volatility of the markets led to such a drain of resources in Mexico that the, the problem that was caused is that we, we became unable to meet our commitments, our dollar-denominated commitments, in a very short time. Uh, now, this is a problem that I think, just as it was in 1982 when we had the debt crisis in Mexico, Mexico was the, 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 the country that had the major problem, and we were the, the, you know, the, the forerunners in resolving that problem. Once again, we, we have become the guinea pigs. The, uh, the issue of volatility of markets is something that is of great concern, not only to Mexico, but to many of the emerging markets in the world and to many even of the, of the developed markets. Uh, this is something that is being discussed by the um, Treasury ministers of the G7. President Clinton is bringing to the G7 summit some proposals precisely to address this problem. Because what happened with Mexico is, is, was a question of enormous concern that nobody had expected before, that something like this could happen. Nevertheless, it did happen. I think it was a lesson for all of us. We are trying, through the program that we negotiated with the United States and other institutions, and, and other countries and institutions, and the internal economic problem, to resolve this kind of thing, create stability in the markets, create stability in the exchange rate of the peso, and, uh, and restore confidence. Probably this last one will be the most difficult one, but I think, as I mentioned, that we seem to be moving in, in the right direction. The economic signs are there that lead us to believe that the worst is over, that the recipes that have been uh, taken, difficult as they have been, are working. And that uh, hopefully this will lead once again to a restoration of confidence, taking into account, of course, that we should avoid the same kind of situations that we faced during 1994. Would you comment on pending American legislation on immigration and how it might affect our relations? Um, we are concerned about this, um, 
this kind of, of measures and legislation. Um, as I mentioned, I th we think in Mexico that this is a mutual problem. Mexicans come to the United States looking not only for a job, but looking for a better and well-paid job. And they come here because those jobs are available here. There is a demand for those jobs here. Um, the, there have been uh, initiatives taken in the past, and actually there are some laws in the books that, written, that nobody pays any attention to here in, in the US, for example, to sanction employers of illegal immigrants. Nevertheless, as I said, by and large, these this are, uh, are not being applied. Uh, one should take into account, you know, what would happen, for example, to the price of produce that comes from California if it were not uh, most of them being uh, worked at by Mexican illegal workers. And I'm not saying that, you know, this is, is, is a great benefit and they should all enjoy that this is happening. No. But nevertheless, there is a, uh, a situation here of mutual convenience that has existed in the past and that therefore we have to address not with recriminatory me measures and especially not with measures or, or, uh, or actions that lead to discrimin discriminatory attitudes. For example, we were very concerned, and we still are, by initiatives such as uh, Proposal 187 that was adopted in California last year. Uh, this, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of measures only build up a resentment against people who are here, by and large, honestly gaining, uh, you, you know, do, doing, doing, uh, doing work. Uh, and, that, um, and that, therefore, the way that this has to be approached by both countries is, first of all, by having a better understanding of why this is happening, both on the Mexican side and on the American side. We have a, uh, a mechanism, a U.S.-Mexican mechanism, that has already or is in the process of undertaking a study precisely of this kind. If you're going to address or resolve a problem, you, first of all, you have to understand what the problem is. So there is a binational study being done right now precisely to address that. The, the, the legislation or the proposals that are under consideration right now have obviously not yet seen that study. Uh, Secondly, I think that we should, uh, that, that any kind of approach should avoid exacerbating tensions between our two countries. I think that, that is very important because the, you know, the people that are going to suffer the most are not just necessarily Mexican illegal immigrants, but even some of the legal, uh, legal uh, immigrants or even American citizens of Hispanic origin that are suffering some of the consequences of this kind of attitudes against immigration. Uh, thirdly, there has to be a realization and understanding of the kind of benefits or how illegal immigration actually con makes a contribution. Uh, there is this widespread belief that illegal immigrants just drain American taxpayers' money in terms of uh, receiving welfare or uh, you know, taking advantage of social services of one kind or another. Uh, by and large, that is not the case. And, and therefore, we have to, you know, s approach this, uh, this problems having in mind, you know, sort of with a very cold head, having in mind this kind of issues and, uh, and taking a constructive and long-term approach. In the final analysis, the best solution that we're going to find to this problem is by fostering the possibility of the, the, the or development, further development in Mexico in order to create a disincentive for, for people to migrate. Uh, there is very little, I can assure you, very little that can be done on this side of the border, even in the, uh, of the kind of repressive measures or building walls or creating blockades that is really going to curtail uh, this situation. Uh, the key to it is really by fostering further development in Mexico so that people will have an incentive to remain where they are. Because they will have a job, they will have a better paid job, they will not have necessarily the lure of migrating to the United States.
It's a detailed question. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the rumor is that the bus drivers union in Mexico City was helping finance the revolution in Chiapas. The specific question is where were they getting the money? So there are two questions. Uh, there is a uh, suspicion that the uh, the union money of the uh, bus uh, of, the, of the union of the buses union in Mexico City was uh, was being used to finance the the Zapatistas in Chiapas. There is uh, at this point, at least that I'm aware of, no confirmation that this is the case. But there is a suspicion in that uh, in that regard. Uh, as to where the money was coming from, uh, not, necessarily, not necessarily fair, but maybe, maybe the, um, the, um, the membership uh, quotas that they, they pay for uh, to the union. Uh, unions in Mexico, by and large, are you know, some, some very powerful economic entities. They have been uh, traditionally. And uh, these, of course, you know, when you think of Mexico City, 20 million people in Mexico City, transportation, uh, you know what that implies in terms of economic resources. Uh, there was some money there. Now there was also some speculation that there may have been other resources that were being funneled through the union uh, into Chiapas. Uh, I will leave it at that. is mer is merely speculation at this point. Uh, Mrs. Carton's uh, observation is that uh, the uh, heavy trading in, in the futures of the on the peso indicate a certain support. What, what is your thinking behind uh, that recent activity? I think that um, the results of the, of the futures trading in the peso, which were quite, uh, quite positive, uh, do show that there is a, a slow but consistent restoration of confidence in Mexico. Uh, it is not the only sign. Um, as I said, for example, the, the stock exchange has also been doing very well. We thought for a moment that maybe this was just, again, some kind of speculative uh, playing around with stocks. However, it's been at least over a week right now that it has been behaving with a certain amount of stability and making gains. Uh, the, uh, and as I said, the peso itself has, uh, has gained some ground. So this, together with what happened um, in, th in the past two days, we entered the futures market for the peso again that we had left. We had stopped doing that, I think, over 10 years ago. We started doing it again. Uh, uh, as I said, the, you know, the results were positive. There was also yesterday an auction of Mexican uh, of Mexican paper that we have been doing uh, with a regular basis. Uh, the results in that regard were also encouraging because interest rates came down approximately 5%. Uh, one of the consequences of the crisis <clears throat> since December is that interest rates just soared tremendously. Uh, in some cases, over 100% in credit cards and in mortgages. I mean, it's just been a very, very, very difficult uh, situation. The fact that right now interest rates are coming down, and I'm talking about levels around 70 percent, but nevertheless they're improving, uh, is also a positive sign. All of this, I think, do amount to, to a show that, first of all, there is a probably even a surprising uh, element here that we did not think that things were going to start looking good so soon. Again, I don't want to be uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I want to be cautious in my optimism. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the expectation that, the, that this spiral uh, that we were into was going to continue for a while has been curbed considerably. And I think that that has been helping to restore confidence in two things. One of them, that the recovery process is going to be a short one, that this, this shock uh, system is not going to be, you know, very long. And secondly, that one of the things that this is proving is that the fundamentals of the Mexican economy are good, are sound, and that, you know, that this can be overcome in, in the not too distant future. Would you comment about uh, parties other than the PRI and uh, 
uh, what their future may be and your perspectives on them? Well, I think there are, <clears throat> there are several changes that are taking place within the PRI and just in the Mexican political system in general. Um, the Mexican political system as we have known it so far uh, really conceived the PRI as part of the system. It was created as such. Uh, the PRI really was not so much a party, a political party in the traditional sense, in other words, a party oriented towards winning elections or getting candidates elected to certain offices, but it was very much integrated into government life. This has a very clear explanation, historical <clears throat> background of Mexico. It was conceived to be that way. It was not a deformation. It was not that this is something that was distorted. It was uh, perceived that this was something that at the time, in the, in the late 20s, could help stabilize the country, give the country political stability. And when you think about it, you know, it has this system, I'm not talking about the PRI, the system provided and has provided Mexico with seven decades of political stability, which is far more than any other Latin American country can claim, and probably more any other country in the developing world. <clears throat> Nevertheless, of course, things had to change. There has been many, many transformations in the in Mexican society, many transformations in the world as we try to integrate ourselves also in a more modern fashion with, uh, with other countries of the world, this kind of patterns had to change. So right now we are, the Mexican government's embarked on, first of all, what will be the eventual separation of the state, of the government rather, and the pre. You say, you speak of a, of a pre-meltdown, that is not going to happen. What is going to happen is that the PRI is, is going to become a political party in the traditional sense of a political party. And it's going to be very similar uh, in nature to the other political parties that have existed in Mexico for some time, and some of them are newer, um, which are now in the opposition. Basically, the PAN, the political act, the National Action Party, and the PRD, the Revolutionary Democratic Party. <clears throat> Therefore, what, what I think that we're uh, in the process of right now is a transformation towards a more democratic and more transparent political system in Mexico in which you're going to have a broader, a fairer, a clearer, clearer a play of several political parties, including the PRI. The PRI may, may remain as the strongest party. It may remain as, as the majority party for some time. And nobody, you know, I mean, can't do anything about it. If they win, they win. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that this is, this is the process that we're in. And of course, like any, any change of, of political systems, any process of this sort, it doesn't happen easily. It is creating enormous conflicts within the party, within the government. Within, between the government and the party, with the other parties. The other parties themselves internally are divided as to where they want things to go. Uh, but again, I think that we should not see this necessarily as, the, you know, there is a crisis in Mexico or the political system is falling apart, but rather see it as a political system that is in the process of a, of a positive and a constructive transformation. And that therefore you're going to find uh, many elements within that system f conflicting with each other, clashing with each other, adjusting to the new pieces of the uh, of the system to what will be, uh, you know, the future nature of it. But that is, at, you know, where we are at this point, basically. What are the uh, possibilities of the privatization of your oil enterprise, which you said wasn't going to be privatized? None. <laughs> You, Let you, me just add, however, that uh, as you're probably aware, some sectors of the petroleum industry are being uh, privatized, petrochemicals, for example. Uh, some of the, um, the gas uh, uh, industry is also in the process of changing its nature, also being uh, privatized. Uh, but 
you know, it's um, <clears throat> Pemex uh, the, and, the, and the oil industry uh, in Mexico. It's a uh, has an enormous symbolic uh, uh, element uh, for 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 Mexicans. Uh, but not only that, but it's also, you know, one of the problems with Pemex, if you want to, if you want to see what its problems are, is that it may be, <clears throat> it may have been riveted with internal problems with its union, maybe it was not too efficiently run, uh, things like that. But it is a very successful business. I think that it is very, it's very um, um, uh, convenient for a government like Mexico's government, for example, we one of the one of the companies or one of the businesses that the Mexican government owned was a casino. It was probably the only money losing casino in the world. We got rid of it. You know, so why you know in the case of somebody of something like an entity which is uh, a cornerstone of uh, of of economic development, uh, there is really very little chance uh, that that uh, that that will happen on behalf of uh, our audience i'd like to thank you very much for an extraordinarily informative evening and a thoroughly enjoyable evening thanks for being with us